Let's go. All right, thank you. I wish my wife could have heard all that, I'll tell you for sure. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, uh, the reason I have uh, been so blessed is because I married way above myself. All husbands do. Right. Amen. There you go. I'm giving you a chance here, fellows, I'll tell you for sure. And so I'm, uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, ladies, for the wonderful song, Little as Much When God is In It. I love that song. It's a great song. And as your dad said, it's a great message in it. And I appreciate you all putting that together and singing for us. And we're delighted to be here. As I said in the Sunday school hour, I started Temple Baptist Church will be 40 years ago this November. And we started with 11 people the first Sunday. So this is a great crowd. And that 11 people was my wife and I. Our daughter was two months old. We had Amanda's wife. And a little girl, uh, and they they dropped off. Somebody pulled up to that storefront building, dropped off about five kids, and drove away. <laughs> Had no idea who they were, but uh, that was the way Temple Baptist began, and it was humble beginning. The Lord has been good to us in a wonderful way, and blessed us beyond my comprehension. We now have building and properties valued at over ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, 21 acres of land. I don't know what would you call uh, acres, but anyway, hectares. in the U.S., what are they called? Hectares. Hectares? All right. Anyway, uh, not sure how big that is, but uh, it's a joy to be here in Australia. I do love this country, and I do love the scenery. It's a beautiful country, uh, but I love the people of Australia. But it's a people that needs the Lord, yeah, and it is a cold country spiritually. It is a very warm country, friendly-wise. A very nice people, wonderful people. Help you in any way they can until you start talking to them about the Lord. And uh, so many times uh, they're turned off by that. But I'm glad you folks are not. Wonderful Australians here that love the Lord Jesus Christ. So stay at this thing. You have a better opportunity of winning Australians to Christ than I would because you are Australian. And so I uh, thank God for you. And this new church getting started, I'm excited about it. We've been glad to help do some things to help get it going. And, and uh, I uh, love the uh, wonderful spirit that I sense here. Very exciting. There's something about a new church getting started that's different than uh, some of the ones that have been going for quite some time, as ours is. And so uh, what, a great, what a great blessing to be here in this place. Uh, as uh, you know, I know Brother Marsh. His investment in my life and him and Hazel and their time in my life, I wouldn't stand here today if they hadn't given me time. They used to come by my house, pick me up for church. My dad worked afternoon shift and unable to work on the weekends. I wouldn't have been able to go to church if it hadn't been to the marshes who come by and pick me up Wednesday night services. You love some young person and invest in their life. There's no telling what they'll do for Jesus Christ. And I am grateful for the investment of that. I'm glad to be back with the Stevensons again, Pastor Paul. Uh, I was here in, uh, what was that, 2012? Was it 2012? And then he, just not long after that, moved over to Perth, which I've never been to Perth, the other side. I've been to Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane here, of course. But um, then he's come back to this area a couple years ago, and I'm thrilled about that to be a part of starting this church. And when I heard that him and Brother Marsh were going to work together, I thought, what a great team. And you know, the work of the Lord is teamwork. Yes. It's not I, it's not me, it's we together doing the work of the Lord. But I, uh, I want you to turn to the 118th Psalm. We're going to look at one verse, verse number 6. In the 118th Psalm, I started a series of sermons uh, back at the beginning of this year on no fear in the new year. Now the Bible deals with a lot of emotions and we are emotional people, not just women, but men are as well. But there is no emotion, if I understand scripture right, no emotion more dealt with than fear. Fear is an acrostic sometimes, false evidence appearing real. Sometimes that's what fear is, false evidence appearing real, fear. But the truth of the matter is there is some fear that's real. I mean, very real, very genuine. It's not false evidence at all. It's a real thing, real fear. 
And so I want to deal with this wonderful verse. I want to help you memorize it. I just preached on this verse last Sunday morning as I finished out that series of sermons on no fear in the new year. In fact, I preached on so many uh, passages about fear that I had to quit calling it no fear in the new year. The new year got old. So I said, <laughs> no fear in the year. And I ended this series with this verse. That's a very easy passage of scripture to memorize. And I helped our church Sunday morning, last Sunday morning. Well, it seems like an eternity ago that was last Sunday morning. But uh, I want us to memorize it here this morning. And I'll read it, and then I want you to uh, read it along with me. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Amen. Isn't that a powerful verse of Scripture? All right, let's read it together. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Psalm 118, verse 6. All right? Let's say it again. Read it again out loud. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Now, I hope by the time this service is over that you'll have that committed to your memory, and I hope that you will use it every time fear starts to get a grip on your life and uh, some anxiety, some worry that you may have, and I hope that you'll let it get a grip on you and say, I'm going to quote that that verse that preacher brought to our attention. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Amen. Now, the 118th Psalm is a wonderful psalm. It really is a messianic psalm. It's really mainly talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and certainly all Scripture is given to us to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a practical application that we can make to this verse of Scripture to all of us. It is sometimes called an envelope psalm, and that is, verse number 1 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, because His mercy endureth forever. And then verse number 29 says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for his mercy endureth forever. It's as if the psalmist is saying to us, start right back again at the start and go on through it again. When you get back to that end verse again, just start back over again and just keep going around and around about the mercy of God. You know, I thank God for his mercy. Isn't his mercy wonderful? I'm glad it is from everlasting to everlasting, the mercy of God. The story is told of Napoleon, who was the emperor in many years gone by, who had a soldier who had uh, deserted and he was about to be executed for his desertion as a soldier and well nigh he deserved it. His mother came to plead for him and she said, Oh emperor, I pray show my son mercy as only a mother could do. And the emperor said, Ma'am, your son doesn't deserve mercy. And she said, if he did, it wouldn't be mercy. Wow. If he did, it wouldn't be mercy. And the emperor began to contemplate that. What a great truth. He doesn't deserve mercy. But if he did, it wouldn't be mercy. And he set her son free. And I'll tell you something, that's exactly what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. He pleaded with our Heavenly Father. And the Heavenly Father says, He doesn't deserve mercy. But with nail-pierced hands, crowned in thorns, and robed in blood, He said, but I paid for it. Yeah. I paid for Him to have mercy. And the Lord has set us free, hasn't He? Amen. John 8, 32, The Son therefore shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. Amen. And I'm so glad for his mercy. That's why I love this psalm. It begins with mercy, ends with mercy. Go right back up to the start and stay with it. Thank God for his mercy. Every night my wife and I, we pray together and I, and I pray, Lord, thank you for your mercy, your grace, your goodness, and your love. Those four things every day. But I certainly start with his mercy. God has been good to me, far, far better to me than I deserve. That's his wonderful mercy. His grace is God giving to me what I don't deserve, and His mercy not giving to me what I do deserve, the wonderful mercy of God. Now, we don't know who the author of this psalm is. Maybe that's best. In some of the psalms, you will see right below the, the chapter division or the division of the psalm. In fact, it's the only book in the Bible where the chapter division were supplied actually by the authors. It's really the, 
It's really the Jewish hymn book, his book of Psalms. And yet this psalm is not a psalm that we know who it was, not a psalm of David that says to us we could speculate on who it is. But the truth of the matter is, it is God as the author. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so God is the author of this book. Oh, this precious book I'd rather own than all the golden gems that ever in monarch's coffers shone, than all their diadems. Nay, were the sea of chrysolite and the earth a golden ball and diamonds all the stars of night, this book were worth them all. Oh, isn't it wonderful, the blessed Word of God that we can hold in our hands and see what God has to say to us. The Holy Bible must have been inspired of God and not of men. I would not if I could believe that good men wrote it to deceive and bad men would not if they could perceive to write a book so good. And surely no crazy man could e'er conceive its wondrous plan. So pray what other kind of men than do these three groups comprehend. It must be that God inspired. Yes the words his holy prophets fire. Isn't it a wonderful truth that we have? This is God's book, and God is speaking to us in this 118th Psalm in verse number 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Now, if you're a preacher, this is a wonderful verse because it is outlined beautifully for us. The Lord is on my side, point number one. Point number two, I will not fear. Point number three, what can man do unto me? And so that's the outline for the message this morning of these three things. First of all, I want you to notice the Lord is on my side. How many of you have ever played soccer? Let me see your hand. Any of you ever played soccer? A few of you have. You played that? Uh, let's see. What do you have over here? Rugby? Do you play rugby? Is that, is, do you do that? Australian football. And I admire Australian football. Where y'all y'all play, we have to get helmets and pads and all kinds of things. And y'all are out there in a pair of shorts and t-shirts <laughs> running around. I'm going to tell you, now y'all are real men. We're just nothing but a bunch of wimps is all we are when you talk about American football. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Yeah, I believe that. I'm telling you, I watch you guys do it. And I said, now that's a real man. Me, I'm a coward. I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to get out there like that. But I want you to notice here where it says the Lord is on my side. Have you ever played organized sports? where the last person picked is generally the worst player and you end up with them on your side? <laughs> Have you ever had that happen to you? You know, my brother, my brother's five years older than I am and we would get out and play American baseball and it would be, we would play and he would pick and another guy would pick and I was always on his side because I was his brother and because I was the last one left. <laughs> so. I got him. But I want to tell you one thing. When I think about this statement, the Lord is on my side. Amen. And I want to tell you something. Now that, that helps me. Boy, we got the best player on our team, don't we? It is the Lord who is on our side. Can you say that this morning? The Lord is on my side? You, you know what you know what happens to a lot of us? We begin to think he wouldn't be for me, but he is. You want to know how much he's for you? Just take a look at his son on that Calvary's cross, hanging there not because nails held him there, but hanging there because he loved you. Amen. His love held him to that cross. That's how much he wants you to know the Lord is on my side. And what a great blessing. Think of who is on your side. In fact, hold your place there and turn to Romans chapter number 8, if you would. Romans chapter number 8. And verse number 31, Romans 8, verse number 31, we read these words. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. The Lord's on my side. Who can be against me? Isn't it a wonderful truth to all of us? And what a great blessing that is. So think of who is on your side. Now you may think, boy, we soccer or rugby or Australian football, whatever it may be, man, we've got the best player. He's got the highest contract. He makes the most money. But I want to tell you to have the Lord on our side, what a blessing. Now, second thing I want you to think about when you think of the Lord is on my side, think of who is. He is. The Lord is on my side. Secondly, how to get him on your side. 
And you need to get him on your side if he's not. Let's turn over to Exodus 32, if you would. Exodus chapter number 32. Back to the left in your Bible. Exodus 32 and verse number 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. Exodus 32, 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you on the Lord's side? Amen. The way you know that, first of all, have you come to Him for salvation? Have you trusted Him as your personal Savior? He is not on your side if you have not been born again. Right. Now that doesn't mean you have to be a Baptist. It's not about being a Baptist. It's about being born again. The Lord is on my side because He is my Savior. Because that summer day, I don't remember the exact date, it was on a Sunday, walked out, prayed prayer, trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I've been saved ever since. So the Lord is on my side because I came unto Him. Jesus says, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now there's two rests in that passage of Scripture. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's the rest of salvation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls. That's the rest of service. And it's a wonderful truth. Salvation and service go hand in hand. And it is a restful thing to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes it's not a restful thing to serve your family. Sometimes you get exhausted. But it's a restful thing to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. My wife uh, just recently had her hip replaced the first day of March. And I took on all of the chores and responsibilities that she does. Now, our kids are grown. They're out of the house. I'm going to tell you ladies something. You all deserve a raise. <laughs> I had no idea. How much went on? I learned how to run the washing machine. Now I'm really running things around my house. See? Yeah. I ran the washing machine, the dryer. I keep forgetting to put in that static clean <laughs> sheet that goes in there. I have to re-dry them again. Did you put the, oh, I forgot that. I learned how to run the dishwasher. I had no idea that you have to wash the dishes before you put them in there. I thought it was a dishwasher. My wife said, did you rinse them? Did you rinse them out run the day? I said, duh. What's a, what's a dishwasher for? All of those things. I'll tell you, there's no rest. I learned how to strip the bed, and wash the sheets, and make the bed. Had no idea. I couldn't bounce a quarter on it or a coin at all. I mean, listen, y'all just really, honestly, you deserve a race. I said that from the pulpit at my church, and one of my deacons came by afterward, and he said, don't tell that from the pulpit. My wife will be wanting a raise. <laughs> now, I don't know. I'll tell you, sometimes I'd finally flop in the bed and say, man, I'm exhausted. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is, when you serve the Lord, there's a great rest to that. Amen. All to know that you're saved. So how do you know that He's on your side? Make your decision for Christ. Then make your decision public. If you want to know He's on your side, let folk know that you're on His side. Amen. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever will deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. So be willing to confess him as your personal Savior. That's what believer's baptism is. I have the, saw the video of the baptism out in the Pacific Ocean there. What a wonderful testimony. That's what baptism is. It's an outward testimony of inward Lee, what's happened in your life? You're saying by getting baptized, since you've been saved by immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, you are saying, I am on the Lord's side. Amen. And then you know what he says? Yeah? Well, I'm on your side too. Amen. Isn't Amen. that a great thing? Amen. Now, see, the Psalm 118.6 doesn't say that I am on his side, it says the Lord is on my side. I like that better. I'll tell you, i got a lot better teammate than me being on his side. He, he doesn't get as much from me being on his side. What I get is the Lord is on my side, and I'm happy about that. So you must be born again to get him on your side. Make that decision publicly known. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus secretly for fear of the Jews. 
But at the cross, he begged for the body of Jesus to be taken down. And he came out and out for Jesus Christ. And Nicodemus came, that one in John chapter number three, who Jesus said to him, you must be born again if you're ever going to see the kingdom of God. He came and helped with the burial, helped anoint his body. You know, the cross will cause people to come out and out for Christ. Amen. And may it cause you to do that as well. And so uh, let it be known how to get him on your side. Think of who he is. The Lord is on my side. All right, let's say that together. The Lord is on my side. Say it again. The Lord is on my side. What a blessing. I will not fear. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear fear. What a bold statement. Make that statement. I will not fear. Say it with me. I will not fear. Have you ever let fear keep you from doing something that you really wanted to do, but you were just afraid? You know, I've always been afraid to sing a solo. I have been. And people after hearing me sing say, well, it's no, no wonder you're afraid. I, I helped sing, and we had a little missions deal for our ladies. Uh, and I was the, there were 11 solos. I was number 12. And I got up, and I was the comedy solo. That's what they said, really. We got the comedy solo as the pastor. So I got up and sang. Thought I didn't do too bad a job. I had a guy come up to me afterwards. He said, well, I'll be honest with you, Pastor. I have heard worse. <laughs> I really appreciated that. That was just, I guess there was a compliment in there somewhere, but I will not fear. A bold statement, make it. Make it regardless of what you hear. Look at the 112th Psalm, if you would. The 112th Psalm, and verse number seven says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. You know what some of you ought to do? You ought to just take a sabbatical from news because it's a world filled with bad news. You know what? You have your heart fixed. I will not fear of evil tidings. No matter what happens, no matter what I hear, I'm not going to be afraid. You know, the devil wants to whisper in your ear, doesn't he? He wants to tell you you're not worthy. You shouldn't. You should be afraid. Oh, I tell you, doubt your salvation. He whispers in our ears. I have people come up to me every once in a while and say to me, Pastor, I'm for you. I don't care what they're saying about you. Yeah. Really? Well, what are they saying? <laughs> I'm thinking everybody's for me, but that's not always true. But isn't it wonderful that all the Lord is for me? I will not fear. No matter what you hear, you might overhear something. That's why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7.21, he said, take no heed to all words that are spoken, lest you hear your servant curse you. Sometimes you're better off not overhearing what somebody is saying. Right. You know? What a wonderful blessing it is to hear good things. So regardless of what you hear, do not fear. Regardless of what you see. You know, they say seeing is believing. That's not always true. Believing is seeing. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, working for us a far more exceeding an eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Well, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Elisha was, uh, you know, he was the great prophet who did twice the miracles that Elijah did. And Elisha was, uh, you know, he was warning the king of Israel exactly when he was going to have an enemy there, and they were able to escape because he was letting him know in the and the king of the other country was, man, who's, who's a traitor in our midst? And they said, it's not, there's no traitor in our midst, it's Elisha. And so they surrounded Elisha and his servant. He saw, he saw all those soldiers surrounding Elisha. They wanted to kill him. And, he, and the servant said, alas, master, what shall we do? You know why he felt that way? Why was he afraid? Because of only what he could see. And Elisha prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And God opened his eyes, and instead of seeing the danger, he saw the deliverance. I mean, surrounding that army of those wicked men, he saw all the angels, a great host of the Lord protecting him. May I say to you this morning, don't see the danger, see the deliverer. Amen. See what God can do by the eye of faith. 
What a great blessing. See what's, what can be. You know what? I'm going to be excited to hear what's going to be as this church organizes today. See it with the eye of faith. Amen. Boy, people said uh, that, that Sunday night uh, after the first service that we had, 11 people in a $12 offering, that's what we had. Uh, my pastor, who was at the time there in Richardson, he called me on the phone, how did it go? And he, I told him how it went. He said, what did you do for special music? I played a record player for special music. Some of you don't even know what a record player is. But anyway, I played a, I played a record player, so because I led the music, I, Brother Paul, I think you were just doing fantastic. Amen. Man, I led the music in those early days. It was, I was awful, but you were good. And uh, anyway, he laughed, my pastor, he laughed, said, you played a record player. Ah, he said, I want to tell you something. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to hold your job open. You can come back. I've been the youth pastor there for a little while. He said, you can come back. And you know what I said to him? I said, I won't be back. Amen. Hire somebody else. God has given me a vision. I see what God is going to do. Amen. That was 40 years ago. Now, we do have over a 1,000 members. I can't find all of them. <laughs> I've, got, I've got the police looking for several of them. They can't find them either. But anyway, we, uh, that's the way churches are, you know. That's, uh, you, know you get some there, where'd they go? You know? But anyway, truth of the matter is, isn't it wonderful that regardless of what you see, look at it with the eye of faith. 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your face should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, what a great blessing it is to think about the things you can't see. So say, I will not fear, regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you see. Thirdly, regardless of what you feel, say, I will not fear. Now, I don't know about you, but feelings are fickle, aren't they? You know what? I can get up some mornings and I can say, good morning, Lord. <laughs> I feel so good. And then sometimes I get up and say, good Lord, morning. <laughs> you ever get up that way, huh? You ever feel that way? It's, you know, feelings are fickle. You, you know, you, you, you say, do you ever wake up grouchy? No, my wife lets him sleep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, uh, we sometimes have great feelings. Feelings are just so unusual, aren't they? They didn't warn me. <laughs> you didn't warn me about getting old and the feelings that come. I told my wife the other day, I said, boy, we're getting old. Some things don't work as well as they used to. She said, nothing works as well as it used to. <laughs> well, the truth is, what a great blessing. Regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you see, regardless of what you feel, say, I will not fear. Say it with me. I will not fear. Fear. Say it, the Lord is on my side. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. I will not fear. Point number three. Point number three reads, What can man do unto me? That's the conclusion. You come there. Why what a greater conclusion? If the Lord is on my side and I will not fear, what can man do unto me? What a great truth. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, He said, And fear not those which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. What can man do unto me? I'm not worried about what man can do unto me. First of all, man can do nothing to me unless God allows it. That's right. Isn't that a wonderful truth? You think about Job and Satan. The Lord, uh, Satan comes to the presence of the Lord in the book of Job, and the Lord says, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, realizing what the Lord said about, you know, said to Satan, I don't want him to say, Have you considered Richard Wallace? What I want him to say is, Satan, have you considered Paul Stevenson? Yeah, have you considered him? <laughs> no, he's the one. Now, he, he's, now me, I, 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 I'll, my channel fold, <laughs> but not Brother Paul. But have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. And Satan says, you know what? Yeah, that's true. But you've got a hedge about him. Everything he touches turns to gold. He's got like a Midas touch. But you touch him and he'll, he'll curse you. He'll quit serving you. And the Lord says, all right, I'll allow you to do that. And he takes away all of his children, 10 children at one time. 10 children all at once. Lost all of his, lost his career, his job, everything he'd accumulated, all of it wiped out at once. And the Bible said the Lord hath given and the Lord hath taken away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord, and all this Job sinned not, neither did he charge God foolishly. And Satan comes back again, and the Lord said, you know what you've done, Satan? You've moved me against Job without a cause. Don't ever imagine that trouble means that you're not in the will of God. In fact, more often than not, it could mean you're right in the center of the will of God. Yes. And so he said, all right, you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. And Job got very, very ill. And Job 2.10, Job said to, his, he said to his wife, Thou speakest one of the foolish women speak. What shall we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? And all this Job said not with his lips. What a great blessing. You see, Satan couldn't do any of that to Job until God allowed it. Right. You know, trouble sometimes comes to us not because we've been sinful, but because God is trying to do something to teach us and help us. Fanny Crosby was a, as a young lady, she was blinded by accident as a young lady, just very small. The doctor put the wrong kind of eye medicine in her eyes and it blinded her. You know what most people would say, what a tragedy. But some of the greatest hymns in the world were written by that blind yes, woman, amen. Fanny Crosby. She penned these words at eight years of age. She said, oh, what a happy soul am I although I cannot see. For I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't to weep and sigh because I am blind, I cannot, and I won't. At eight years of age, she penned those words. Fanny Crosby penned some great hymns. We still sing them. I suspect there's a number of them in this hymn book, although I haven't looked through it. One of the great hymns that I love of Fanny Crosby is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, yes, the foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. I'd sing it for you, but you wouldn't recognize it, all right? <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is, it's a wonderful thing. When trouble comes, sometimes God allows some things that we think, what a tragedy, when really God is using it for his glory. John 9, 2 and 3, his disciples asked him, said, Master, here, here is a man who was born blind. Who did sin, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, you know what? All of us would think how unfair God was to let that little baby you know how parents are, you're all excited about the baby, you get the, you get the nursery, the crash all, all set up, and you've got a baby coming, and it's, a, and it's a little boy. How excited. Boy, dad's all excited, mom's all excited. She's got a little baby boy. And suddenly they realize he's blind. Blind. Why would God have allowed that? Now he's of age at this point in time, and yet he's still blind. Jesus comes by and touches his eyes and causes him to be able to see. Why did God allow that baby to be born blind? So that he could come by one day and touch him and heal him with his blindness. And he said, I don't understand that. <clears throat> my father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad I know he maketh no mistakes. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Sometimes we wonder why would God have allowed certain things to happen to us. What may seem like a tragedy now, in retrospect down the line, you look back on him and say, boy, I'm glad God allowed that to happen. I'm saved, I'm serving the Lord, whatever it may be. Could I say to you this morning, <clears throat> The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Will you trust him? You think about David and Goliath. Here's, here's big old Goliath and David going after him as a young lad. Someone would say, man, look how big Goliath is. He is nine foot tall. What a basketball player he would have been, wouldn't he? <laughs> nine foot tall. And uh, someone said, look how big Goliath is. Look how little David is. You know what David was saying? Look how big God is and how little Goliath is. Yes, yes. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's no loss. We often say, well, I lost a loved one. I lost a loved one. You know what? That's true on our side. But if they're saved, that's no loss for them. Heaven's their gain. And so isn't it wonderful to know that we can say, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? 
the story is told of Dr. John R. Rice, the editor of the Sword of the Lord, great author, had him preach at our church one time. Uh, often so had him preach before he died, like you could have him afterwards. But anyway, uh, uh, John R. Rice preached for us and, and uh, said one time that somebody robbed him. And they stuck a gun, he stuck a gun in his face, and he had glasses and he pulled them down on his nose, he said, as he did. He said, you're not going to scare me with heaven. Right. Now, now, I don't know about you, I wouldn't have been quite that brave, I believe. But the fi facts are, what can man do unto me? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. Say it with me again, let's quote the passage. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear, what can man do unto me? Now let me ask you this question. Is he on your side? Have you been saved? Do you know for sure? Do you know that you know that you know if you died today, heaven would be your home? Now the only way you can know that is if Jesus is your Savior. Now that doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means that you know that you've been born again. None of us are what we ought to be or are one day going to be. But you know there's been a definite time in your life when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Now, if there hasn't been, this would be a wonderful day for you to be saved. If you know the Lord is on your side and that you've been saved, this would be a wonderful day for you to dedicate yourself to say, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. How many of you can say, I know that I know that I am saved, that I've been born again, and if I were to die today, heaven would be my home. Can you lift your hand and hold it high in the air as a testimony of that fact? I know that I am saved. God bless you. Thank you, you and take your hands down. How many of you are here this morning, you couldn't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you at all.